So um, here's a, a quick overview of what we're going to be looking through. So some introductions and objectives. Um, what does the future look like? And I, I don't pretend to have a crystal ball. Um, uh, the VUCA model, um, some ideas about listening and research, um, working with your existing customers and distribution channels, and then we'll work through a bunch of useful tools that are designed to help you uh, identify new opportunities and e evaluate new opportunities, and also look at your current product range and see what, what more can you do with it. Um, so in terms of objectives, um, my goal this morning is to provide you with a set of tips and actions to enable you to identify future opportunities. Um, all, all of the stuff I'm giving you, hopefully you can simply take away and do. Um, there is at the back of the presentation, a when you get a copy, um, a, a list of all the references. So if you want to do some more reading, then um, the links are all there for you. Um, and, and secondly, is to enable you to write your own future opportunities action plan. Um, I know a couple of the people on, on the call, I've worked with them quite closely during the year, but for those I've, I've not met before, um, I've been leading and consulting with marketing teams for the past 10 years. Um, prior to that, I've got extensive sales and marketing ex leadership experience across several markets. Um, and for the last five years, I've been work conducting consulting, uh, uh, working with organisations as a consultant through the AGP and, and also directly with clients. So that's uh, in, enough of me. Let's move into the, um, the content. So in terms of, of what to expect and, and plan around, right? I, I, as I said, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but I've got four points I'd like you to think about when looking for new opportunities. Right? It's anyone's guess where we will be in the next 12 to 24 months time. Um, you know, we, we're living in a, a, a world that has been severely disrupted. Um, that, that's changing customer people's expectations. It's changing customers' expectations. Um, we, the travel disruption we've seen this year um, I would expect to continue for some time, and that affects how we conduct our business um, and uh, how we how we work with customers, how we engage with, with customers. Um, customers' expectations have changed. You know, I've um, I generally I, I I travel quite a lot, um, and the, uh, the the bookcase behind me is the furthest I've been since uh, since February. So they you know that's that I'm still working with customers every week, but they, they their expectations have changed. Um, and and finally, uh, this slide was written at the at the start of the week. So I've put the economic recovery is dependent on a on a vaccine availability. Um, hopefully, we're approaching that fairly rapidly. Um, but you know, we, it, it's going to take time for for the economic recovery to kick in. And, and when it does, I, my, my own thinking is we, we know we're not going to go back to the way we were in January and February this year. And the, the, the world of business will have changed. And leading on from that, all I'm trying to do is say you need to be agile and flexible in your approach. Listen to people um, and, and be prepared to change your plans and adapt to the environments that, that surround you. Um, the, the next slide brings in a concept of, of uh, VUCA, uh, which it came out of the American military in, I think it was the 70s or 80s. Uh, and it's been well adopted within the business community. So VUCA stands for um, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and, and ambiguity. And, and for me, it's a really useful model uh, in, in today's climate, in today's environment. Um, and the, if you look at the arrow on the left, um, it looks at how well you can predict the outcome of your actions. Um, I mean, we, we're working in a rapidly changing world. So decisions, you know, making decisions and being able to forecast where that 
what outcome you get from that. Your ability to do that is impacted. And then the arrow on the bottom, on the, y, on the X axis, is how much do you know about the situation? And, and certainly in, in today's situation, we know very little, you know, things change as we've seen over the last six weeks, fairly rapidly. Um, so the, this, this model um, is, I, I think gives you a helpful understanding of, of how to approach business planning. So volatility is, is the rate of change. And that's the, the, the pace at which change is happening. Um, and, and for me, this year, the pace of change has been significantly faster than anything we've seen before. Um, and, and we've seen, you know, that that pace of change, we've seen businesses that have really struggled and we've seen other businesses that have taken off like an express train. Um, uncertainty is, is when you're unclear about the present. So you're not sure um, you're dealing with lots of uncertainty around you. So you, you've been forced to make decisions without a clear explanation of, of uh, all the facts and, and their implications of the decision. Um, complexity is when you've got multiple key decision factors. So you know, you're having, you, you're all of running businesses, involved with businesses and making decisions. Um, complexity is when that you're making a decision and, and having to take into account several key factors, all of which you might be unclear about. Um, which makes the, the risk of, of the decision, uh, of the probability of the decision being, being less than optimum increases. And, and, and that means you need to be prepared to, to chop and change and, and be agile. And finally, ambiguity is, is lack of clarity about the meaning of an event. Um, I mean, if you think back to January, December, late December and January this, this year, uh, did, when the first news was starting to come out of um, Wuhan about this mystery virus. Um, I don't think any of us expected to, or very few of us, um, expected to be experiencing what we've done this year. So ambiguity is about that lack of clarity. None of us really understood the meaning of, of what was happening. So what, what does this mean in, in terms of... Um, your, your business. So what I'd suggest you do is you need to stay agile. So be prepared, be, be prepared to change and, and move and, and based on what's happening around you um, and be flexible. Um, and, and critically, right, and this will come up through several slides, and um, keep asking questions, right? challenging questions. The, 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 the questions you get lots of value from are those that are often uncomfortable to ask. Um, analytical questions, you know, and, and, and the couple of, the, of you on the call that have worked with me now, I'm a great believer in trying to get hold of some data um, and, and some feedback. So I ask analytical, analytical questions. Use the five whys. And the five whys is a, a, a concept that, um, that, that says if you keep asking why about something five times you you it forces you to uh, really get to the root cause of, of something um, and it's used in a number of scenarios um, work with open-ended questions how what who why um, so they tend to get more information from people and and finally um, persistence Right. You've all, you're all in, in business or in leadership positions and um, you've got there because you are persistent and, 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 and persistence in, in these times is, is particularly uh, effective. So in terms of, of listening and research, uh, let me get rid of this. Where are we at? In terms of listening and research, um, ask questions of, of your customers, right? And, and when you ask a question, um, listen to the answers. Um, ask questions of your employees and, and team members. They will have different views, 
different experiences um, and, and different relationships with, with clients. So we'll get different information from them. Um, partners and suppliers. Right? Talk with your partners and suppliers and ask them about where they see opportunities, what, 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 what they think is, is happening in the future. Um, for those of you with distribution channels, right? engage with your distri distribution channels. Um, speak with different people in there, not just the, your normal contact that perhaps you 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 place these orders with you, but you know have, talk to five, six, seven, eight people in the distribution channels and get different views about um, where they see opportunities and and where they see their customers need additional help or or product or services. Um, look at the competition. And I'll come back to the competition in, in one of the later slides. Um, but look at what the competition is doing, um, not just at what they're doing and, and succeeding with, but also look at, at um, what they're doing and perhaps not being so successful with. Um, and again, I'll touch on this on, on the last slide. Um, listen to business leaders, right? There's lots of content, you know, out there with business leaders. Um, who, who bring a breadth of experience to the world. So do some reading that, that, that published by business leaders. Um, it will help generate new ideas and thoughts about your own business. Work with business help organizations and, and you know, AGP is a, is a really prime example of this. So, um, you know, work with your AGP relationship manager. Um, and, and if you see opportunities or you, you, you think you've got a, an, an idea for an opportunity, give them a ring, talk it through with them. That's what they're there for. Many of the banks will provide business development help. Um, and finally, go to the informed press. So places like the Harvard, the Harvard Business Review, the Economist, the LSE blog, um, all of them provide a, a wealth of um, well-informed, objective business information. Um, and there's some references in, in, in the reference slide um, to help you find those. So um, when we, <coughs> the previous slide has talked about customers and, and, and distribution channels. So this is some data from Bain and Company. Um, Bain and Company is one of the global business strategy organizations. Um, and this research isn't you, but it stood the test of time. Um, and what Bain tells us uh, is acquiring a new customer can cost five times more than, than retaining an existing customer. So um, one of the later slides, I'll be talking about how we uh, look for new opportunities with existing customers, because it's easier to sell a, uh, a second or third product to an existing customer that it is to create a new one. I'm not saying don't, we all need new customers, so don't stop doing the new customer bit, but also think about what more you can sell to existing customers. Um, increasing customer retention by 5%, can increase profits by 25 to 95%. So churn in businesses varies um, dramatically um, from business to business. Um, I've got one client on the program uh, that works in the conveyancing world. And, and because we tend to change properties uh, about every 10 years or longer now, um, their churn is very high. They're continually looking for new customers because they're existing, you know, they do, they, they help someone with a conveyance um, and, and then they don't buy a property again for 10 years. Um, other businesses, the, the churn rate is, is, is really low. Um, and, and, but look at your customer retention, see if you can improve that customer retention because um, that gives you new opportunities. Um, and, and the last one is the success rate of selling to a customer you already have is 60 to 70% whilst the success rate of selling to a new customer is five to 20%. And when we look at a, in one of the later slides at the ANSOF matrix, um, I'll talk more about this. So, um, so, so that's, and, and the, those, the, that thinking in, in the thinking in, in this slide applies both to your customers and, and distribution channels. So um, where that trust is built and in place, 
um, you're pushing against an open door. So the first of, of the tools um, we're going to look at is the pestle or macro analysis. Um, this is a, an, a, 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 an analysis piece that looks at what's going on in, in the outside world um, around your business. Um, and it's used in several different contexts. contexts. Um, it looks at political, economic, social, technology, legal and environmental factors that are uh, working on your business. So throughout the, the, the presentation, you'll see I've used the analogy of, of Barry's Bike Shop. So um, I've long had a sort of one of those dream things of running a bike shop um, with, with my brother. It's never going to happen, but it's a nice thought to have. So in the slides, um, I've, had, I've used the analogy of Barry's Bike Shop to illustrate uh, some of the tools. So in the, in the um, example here with Barry's Bike Shop, with the um, pestle example, um, political factors. Um, an example of that for a bike shop would, would be, how can we influence the creation of more cyclist lanes in the local, in, local community? Um, that will encourage more cyclists. Economic factors. Um, there's increased demand from delivery cyclists in, in the city centre. Uh, a social factor is and an example of that on, on a bike shop is cycling is seen as a family friendly, family and envir environmentally friendly activity. Um, certainly when my two girls were, were younger, we would take bikes up into the forest to Dean and, and cycle. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a, a, a good example of a, a social factor. Um, technology factors. The cycling world is changing quite, I mean, it's, 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 it's changing quite dramatically. A really good example of that is, is electric bikes. Um, I mean, five years ago, they were, they, were, they were for sort of geeks and people who couldn't pedal. Um, and they've been really strongly endorsed now by uh, the cycling community. Um, and certainly people turn up at, at cycling clubs and with, with electric bikes. And they're enabling more people to cycle and exercise. So that's an example of a technology factor imp impacting the business. Um, legal factors. <coughs> so currently how we're allowed to operate and implementing social distancing in the shop, uh, the cycle shop is, is an example of legal, legal factors um, impacting the business. Um, and finally, environmental factors. Um, you know, pandemic has encouraged people to exercise more and cycle sales have grown dramatically. Um, it, it, cycling is very environmentally friendly um, and people are, the, the, uh, people are buying bikes to commute and, and, and exercise. And, and that's, a, a, again, a, an example of an environmental factor, people using bikes to be uh, environmentally friendly. So that's the, the pestle um, a macro environment, macro analysis. The next one is a SWOT. So a SWOT analysis is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And um, this is a tool that your AGP relationship manager is very familiar with and is very happy to, to run through with you and, and facilitate. Um, I would suggest that when you do this, you you uh, you you look at you work with a team. But don't try this on your own. Work with a team of people. You get far more um, interaction and, and and beneficial ideas if you if you work that way. A SWOT analysis looks at uh, strength. The internal factors are strengths and weaknesses, um, and external factors are opportunities and threats. So again, within the, the exam, using the example from Barry's Bike Shop, um, a, a strength is local community relationships, technical expertise. Um, that's a made up one. Please don't ask me to change your tire. Um, innovative website and, and 500 regular customers. Weaknesses. Um, someone who's who, someone who's who's who makes a, a sells marketing consultancy. I hesitated about the first one, so I'll put in the concept of Barry's Bike Shop: no marketing skills in house. 
Um, so please feel free to have a giggle at that one. Um, repair and servicing time is always fully booked. So, um, you know, finding bike engineers is, is difficult. Um, limited shop space to display the new electric models. The shop isn't big. Cramming new models and technology is difficult. And, and also another weakness aligned to that is electric bike skills in the workshop. You know, the guys who work in the, in, 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 in the workshop are good with chains and pedals and, and things. Batteries are new to them. Um, opportunities, um, electric bikes. They are selling really well. Um, a larger shop, one dedicated to electric bikes. Uh, we could offer more financing options on, on upmarket models to make it easier for people to buy. Um, and uh, second-hand bikes for young children. And finally, the threats. So these are threats are um, things that could impact negatively on, on, on the business. So, um, and here, you know, large national chains, if, if say a Halfords opened up in town, um, it would, it potentially would have a negative effect on, on the business. Um, E-commerce sites, I mean, people like Wiggle, Pre present uh, the world with an excellent choice of cycling products that you can buy online. Um, and then finally, another threat uh, opposite with it to the environment one would be heavy traffic pushing people away from cycling. So cycling on a road now with the traffic levels we have um, compared with 25 years ago is a different experience. Um, it was brilliant during the first lockdown because the roads were nice and empty, but um, certainly the roads are as busy as they were. So that's an example of a, uh, a swap analysis. Um, please take that and, and use it within your own business. It, it always generates some ideas and useful thoughts about how to move your business forward. The next example is, the next tool is, is Porter's Five Competitive Forces. Uh, Michael Porter was a or is a business strategist um, that published a series a series of books. Um, central to all of those was this theme of the competitive forces. Um, and he argues that there are five competitive forces working on on any business. So the first is the, is the one at the, the in the circle, competitive rivalry. So in the case of, of Barry's bank shop, that would be having two, three, three four of the bike shops within, within town. Um, <coughs> buyer power is the second. So buyer power is the way a, a customer can exert power over your business. Um, so an example of that with the bike shop would be the local cycling club um, with 50 members and wants to negotiate a discount brings me new customers, but squeezes my margin. And similarly, the local school may want to do the same type of, uh, of arrangement. Um, threat of new entry. So uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier. So a, a new entrant would be a large cycling shop opens up locally or an online cycle shop um, provides clients with a different way of acquiring cycling. Um, equipment and, and, and cycle wear. Um, supplier power. So um, this is, is where your suppliers uh, exert pressure on you as, as, as a business. Um, and, you know, Barry's Bike Shop is a small customer. We, we're a small local business. Uh, when it comes to buying and acquire and, and buying product in from large global brands, um, we've got no power. So if, if those key brands push for a price increase, um, that may well Im impact my margin. Um, or if they force restricted contracts on me um, and I want to sell that brand, um, again, I've, I've got little power to work with them. And then finally, threat of substitution. And, and, and again, e-bikes and e-scooters are a good example of, of um, substitution where uh, people are, are buying a, an e-bike rather than a traditional bike. So that's, that's the uh, five competitive forces that are probably working on your business in some way, shape or form. Um, and I, I, what I'd ask you to do and use that in terms of, 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 
uh, identify new new businesses is think about that model with with the context of your own business and think about how that generates opportunity for you the next um tool is a an ansoft matrix and um, and and there are references on the reference slide to all of all of these tools so if you want to do more reading um you please do so um so on the y-axis uh, and Ansoff was, a, again, another business and marketing strategist. Um, on the y-axis, uh, we look at existing markets and new markets. And then on the x-axis, uh, right on the bottom of the chart, we look at existing products and, and new products. Um, and this is particularly relevant when you're looking at new opportunities. So what Ansoff said, is if we look at the green square on the left hand side that, that's called market penetration and um, what Ansoff said is when you're taking uh, existing products to existing markets you're trying to improve increase your market penetration um, and uh, that generally is the easiest way to uh, to increase your business size and uh, it's probably the one with the least risk or the highest probability of success. Uh, in terms of the bike shop, what we might do there is digital marketing campaign to attract new customers um, or open more hours to improve the service. Uh, <coughs> still on the, the same side of the chart, um, top left yellow uh, square, where we're taking existing products to new markets um, this is the Ansoft called this market development. Um, and this is where you are looking for um, new types of clients in it might, might be a new location, it might be a, a new geography, it might be a new vertical market for you. So in terms of the bike shop, um, it would be only a second bike shop in a new location or maybe open, opening an online cycling store. So then we're taking the same products, but we're, we're taking them to, to new customers. Um, this is, in terms of uh, probability of success, this is the uh, second one the most likely to succeed. The risk factor here is slightly higher than, than market penetration, but still, you, because it's products you're familiar with, um, you, your probability of success is still very good. On the right hand side of the chart, at, at, at the bottom in the yellow, um, we've got product development. And product development is where we're taking new products to existing markets. So, um, we, we, we're, taking, we're, we're bringing new products and trying to sell them to our existing customers. Um, so it's, again, in terms of the bike shop, that would be st starting to sell e-scooters in the existing shop to the, the, the customers we already have, um, or starting to sell e-bikes in the existing shop. Um, and again, the, the, the reason it's in yellow is the, the probability of success and the risk factors for product development um, are about the same as market development. So um, that you know, providing you approach it in an objective and planned manner, success is the probability of success is is, is very positive. Um, and finally, in, in top right hand side, in in the sort of ready pink colour, um, is diversification. And diversification is when you start to take new products to new markets. Um, and, and this is where you, uh, for, in terms of the bike shop, I, I open an e-scooter shop in a no, new location, a uh, completely new town. So the, 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 the local population aren't familiar with my brand. They don't know me. They don't know the shop. Um, and, and also, I'm trying to sell them a completely new product. Um, or maybe opening a running shop in a new location. So again, it's new products in, into new markets. Um, th the reason this is picked out in red is because the risk factor here um, and the probability of success 
is it, the risk factor is much higher and the probability of success is much lower. Um, I'm not saying don't do it because there are times when this is a really good opportunity for you, but you need to be aware of the risks and, and factor those into your business planning. So there's no rights and wrongs with any of these. Um, all I'd ask is that when you look, when you you are looking for new opportunities and evaluating them, is think about the ANSOF matrix and the probability and risks um, and how that fits with your business. Um, the next tool is BCG product matrix. So uh, BCG stands for the Boston Consulting Group. Um, and again, there's references in, in the back of the slide deck. Um, I, this is a, the, the language in, in the BCG product matrix has, has evolved over the last few years. Um, so let me just explain the, the matrix. The, the, the purpose of this is to help you look at your current product range and, and evaluate which products are, are working and have opportunity and, and which products you need to be thinking about do we continue with. So on the y-axis on the left-hand side going uh, from low to high, we've got cash usage and um, a market growth rate. And on the x-axis at the bottom of the chart, um, going from left to right, we've got cash generation with high on the left and, and low on the right. And then relative market share with high on the on the left and uh, low on, on the right. So <clears throat> what the Boston Consulting Group say is your products will probably fit into one of these four quadrants. Um, and the sort of easy one to think about, the one in green on the bottom left, um, is is the called cash cows. So this is where you're taking a product with um, a, a high cash generation, a relatively high market share um, and um, relatively low cash usage and, and, and probably a low market growth rate. Um, so in the terms of the bike shops, the bike shop, um, these are products, that, an example would be the mountain bike range, which has a high volume every month um, I don't really need to spend much in terms of marketing um, and there's a healthy mountain biking community around the shop um, who like to, you know, they like to change the bikes regularly and they get a good service from me. So the cost of sale is relatively low, the volume is good and the margin is good. And that's an example of a cash cow. And you will all have within your business cash cows. Right? Um, and, and the strategy for these is, is to milk them, right? You, you, these products generate your revenues, generate your margin and generate your profits and help you invest in other products. So you look after these and, and nurture them, um, but be aware that they are the uh, margin engine within your business. And then if we move up to the stars, um, these are products where you've got a high growth rate and, and high market share. Um, these are, again, relatively easy for you. These are products where you need to invest, right? You, you, it, it, you've got high growth rates, put some marketing behind them, open new outlets, find new customers, um, really push that growth rate. These are where your next generation of cash cows come from. And the example in, in the bike shop is the new e-bike range, which is selling well, um, but the market's still really growing and I feel we can probably double or treble the sales of, of the e-bike range over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and then on the, the right hand side, um, at the top, we've got the question mark. Um, and these are products with a high growth rate and low market share. So you know the market's growing, um, but actually you're not selling very much for whatever reason. And, and the, the question you've got here is, do you invest in these um, or do you discard dependent on the, the, the problem? And there's a spelling typo there, apologies. Um, or do you do, do invest in these or discard dependent on the probability of success? So 
An example within the bike shop is the new e-scooter range, um, which isn't selling well. And there's some legal questions. Um, if you think about the pestle analysis, there's some still some very relevant legal questions and limitations about how e-scooters can be used um, that I think are impacting the range. So the question there is, do we continue to stock them um, and persist with them, or do we perhaps park them for now and, and, and revisit that market in two years' time? Um, and finally, in, in the bottom right, we've got pests. Um, these are products with a low growth rate and low market share. Uh, and and these, these are burning your cash. These are, are taking the margin from the cash cows and, and uh, using it in a negative way. So, and, and uh, the question here is, do you, how do you liquidate them? Do you stop, just stop selling them? Do you divest them? Um, so do you, you know, perhaps sell them off, get someone else to, to buy that part of the business? Um, or is there a way of repositioning these in, in a different way? Um, the last thing you do is just ignore them because these, these guys are burning your cash. So an example of this um, is the, the children's bike range, um, which is low margin and, 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 and low volume. Um, it's got some plus points in that it, it, it keeps me engaged with the family um, and probably a broader part of the value, value uh, proposition. Um, but in terms of cash usage, it's a negative for me. So the reason I included this, because the, the presentation is about identifying new opportunities, is to encourage you to think about your current products and where they sit within your portfolio and, and, and how you can reuse them. And, and, and also, which, which products do you need to step away from to release time and energy to think about new opportunities? So the business model canvas. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Business model canvas is a concept that came out of agile and lean thinking. Um, and it's a way of capturing a business idea on, on, on one page. Um, this might be, a, it's a big page. So it might be something you capture on a whiteboard. It might be something you build using yellow stickies on a wall, um, or it might be something you do in a digital um, document. Um, but it, it, it's a very effective way of um, capturing all the concepts around a, uh, a, a, a business concept or a, a market opportunity and giving you an understanding of, of uh, what you need to do uh, to be successful and evaluating whether or not you can be successful with that. So when we look at the, the bike shop example, so um, it, it, the, on the left-hand side, we've got key partners and we've got some brands of product here that I sell. Uh, key activities that we do, so cycle sales, cycling accessory and sales, cycle repair and servicing. So these are all the, the, the activities where we're generating revenue. Um, key resources that we have in the business, we've got shop premises, uh, we've got a workshop and storage premises. Um, we've got the cycling website, we've got the staff skills and experience, and, and we've got stock. Um, and then in green, we've got the value prop, so the value proposition. Um, so we're a family-friendly cycling store. Right? And that's why we, we, we stay with the kids' bikes, right? because it's a core element of the value, broader value proposition. Um, High level of expertise, some, not me, some of the guys who work in the shop are really expert with the bikes. Um, a wide range of bikes for all ages. So, you know, that, again, that attracts the families into the shop. Um, and we make it easy to people buy with financing options. And you can spend a lot of money on a bike now. Um, and then um, customer relationships is, is a the next asset in, in the business canvas. So here we've got local cycling community, the local cycling clubs, um, 500 past customers that are regular buyers from us, and then subscribers to the website and social media. 
um, customer segments um, to think about for a cycling shop are cycling club members, family cyclists and, and off-road cyclists. And, and each of those customer segments are um, specific with different needs and requirements. Um, and then channels in, in this instance refers to marketing channels. So um, the, and the channels we use for marketing are social media, website, club meetings, email, um, the shop um, and, and workshop. And finally, at the bottom, we've got cost structure um, and then revenue streams. And, and that captures in, in quite a simple format the, 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 the basics of, of business. And, and I've included it here because it helps you evaluate new opportunities and new markets. And when you move on to evaluating those new opportunities, um, and certainly Kevin and Damon will be very familiar with these questions. Um, I'd ask you to use these questions. Right? Um, and these are the heart of much of the consulting I do is first one, who's the customer? Right? Who's actually going to part with money and buy the product or service? What is their problem or opportunity? So why do they need your product or service? Um, when evaluating the, 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 the opportunity, how many potential customers are there? You know, if, if, if there's only 10, is it really going to work? Uh, might be 10 vast ones, but there's risks with that. Um, so how many, how many times will people buy the product or service? Uh, next question is, how will your solution solve their problem at an acceptable price point? Um, what is the competition? Why would the client choose you? And we saw on the um, uh, we saw on the, the business canvas the value proposition about why the client would choose Barry's Bike Shop, and 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 then how does the client want to buy the product? And that's often the most difficult. Not happen, and it's phrased this way intentionally. It's not how do you want to sell. It's how does the client want to buy the product? So please take those questions away, and again. Use them when evaluating new opportunities. Right, last couple of slides. Um, I, I love this slide. I came across this a, a few months ago. And, and the, the intent here is to encourage you to think differently. So um, the picture is a Second World War plane. And um, the RAF presented this and, and the, on, the, on the plane, the red dots are uh, damage that was sustained by planes that were landing, returning from um, uh, missions in, into Europe. And the RAF uh, commissioned um, some work done on where to place armour on the planes. And, and their intent was to place armour where the red dots are because that's where all the damage was on the planes that were returning. And they, they engaged a, uh, a mathematician called Abraham Wald, who pointed out that this was the damage on the planes that were returning. And, and that actually made them successful. What they probably needed to be doing was thinking about um, reinforcing the planes on the areas uh, that weren't damaged, because that's probably where the damage was causing the planes not to return. Um, so it's some reverse logic um, that was very successfully implemented. Um, and again, what I'd ask you to do and, and apply this in your business is, is, is look at, at what doesn't work as well as what is working, because um, it just gives you a different perspective. So um, I think this is the last slide before questions. Um, I, in terms of identifying future opportunities, um, here's a very simple action plan I, I, that you, you can recreate very quickly in a, a spreadsheet or a table. Um, and it looks at actions, description, who, and, and, and those who work with me know, I'm always keen on putting someone down who's going to do, take the action. Um, when's it due? And, and, and some comments. So an example um, here we've got, we've got in the, the first row, uh, it's run a, a team swap and pestle analysis. 
Um, the description is two sessions, two sessions of 90 minutes, and the sales manager is, is going to run that and when. So um, it's just a simple way of documenting stuff, making sure it happens, and, and then you're able to, to work forward and move forward. So there's the references. So um, Lisa, that's um, all the, the, the content we've covered. Would you like to, uh, are there any questions that you'd like help with? Uh, I haven't got any on the chat facility unless anybody wants to come off microphone and ask yourself. Barry, it's Andrew Beer here. Hi. Hi. Just on the business model canvas, it's quite a complex tool. Um, just the order in which you'd go about it through the different sectors, sec sections. Now let me go up to... Um, so wait, I think what you're saying is where would you start? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would start with the customer segments, for instance, and then work through value proposition. I, I, right, right I, side of the of it first. I, I'm completely with you. That, 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 because I would start with customer segments, customer, the, the customer relationships, um, and then understand the the value that you're providing for them, and and then the rest of it you work out from there. Okay. Does that help? Is that the? Yeah, I'm just yeah. thinking of the other guys on the um, on the session. Really, if we had a number one one to nine, whatever the number is, then it would be a good sort of logical process to go through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can find. I mean, this, this I created this in a, a charting um, thing, but it, again, in the reference section, there's, there's a link that will take you through to some uh, references on. On the business canvas, and I, th I think the your business relation, your AGP relationship manager could probably help you with this as well. Oh, well, I'm one of those. That's why um, <laughs> I've asked the question. <laughs> I, I, I use I use this a lot, and uh, yeah. it's it is quite a complex tool to, uh, and it takes quite a while to go through it when it's got some meaning behind the detail in it, if you like. Yeah, it's, and, and how effective do you find it? I think it's um, it's a little bit clunky and overkill for some small businesses, and we have lost them through the process, if you like. But for the people, if you can get two or three people together in a room, it, it it's really powerful. And you can do it on a product as well, not just on a business. Um, so if you think of a new product to launch, then you know you can use this to go through and and check out all the various parts of it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I've included it in here. So. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions, Lisa? I've got nothing coming up on chat. That you any, any, <laughs> any questions, folks? Anybody want to come off, Mike? <clears throat> no, I think you must have uh, covered everything in your uh, in your webinar there, Barry. Either that or they all want to go and grab a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Or they've got plans because it's the first weekend and go meet their friends in the pub now. It is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know you have to shoot off as well this morning, but um, I know we've got your details. If anything comes up at a later stage, they can contact you and ask you then, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to go to the, the, the wrap up slides? We, um, yeah, just yeah, just a reminder for you all to keep an eye out for the forms that will come through to you because it is important that we get those back. Um, I'll be sending those out in the next hour or so. Um, and apart from that, just to say thank you to Barry for giving up your time this morning delivering this webinar. Thank you, everybody else, for um, turning up as well. And enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. Yeah, thanks, folks. Thanks, thanks for everyone. listening. And thank, thank you for the question. Bye. Bye.